me. No. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. You need to stand in the light. Cheat to that sky. Thank you. So I know you're expecting the amazing Tim Straub tonight. Um, and we apologize that he's not here, but we've um, stepped up to the plate. But we do have a message from him. So he says a few words from our absent director. Thank you for joining us for an evening of sharing and listening to neighbors and friends tell a few stories, Rangely style. I'm so sorry not to be here with, with all this evening, but familial um, duty has called and I'm down in New Jersey sitting around a kitchen table telling and hearing a swirl of stories about the sister I have recently lost. Life is funny this way. The pain of loss is equal to the joy of having had. Sorry light and I have glasses. It's really tricky. Okay. Um, before kitchen tables, I suppose there were animal skins draped over rocks and caves. I can see Cro-Magnon and Neanderthals, all those millennium, millennia ago, swapping tales of day's hunt, hunched over a rear bed of the rock-hewn wheels. Oral storytelling has become an essential as breathing and binge-watching Netflix. Mm -hmm. It makes the food more savory, the fire a little warmer, and the blood a whole lot thicker. The kitchen table is the family's daily routine's epicenter. It's where we catch up, catch up with one another. It's where we come to nourish our bodies and our souls. It's where parents and children negotiate how long the kids can stay out this Saturday night. It's where we learn and demonstrate proper dining etiquette. My mother said, she wanted me to be able to dine with the kings and party with the peasants. I dare say she succeeded, but I prefer the peasants. Who really cares where the damn forks go, just as long as they're there? Hell, I've seen some people, um, I've seen some of you people eating before. Forks proved to be an impediment. And that's all he had to say. <laughs> So um, Tim invited us here this evening, and I know this has been in the back of his mind for quite some time, but it's been in his heart for a very long time. His ability to spin a tail and um, sometimes leave you mind boggled because you're trying to follow and you think you are, but you're not really sure. Is he pulling one on over? Yeah, you know, Bob. that's Tim. Um, and I'm just really sad that he can't be here tonight, but I know there's going to be many more opportunities. So we thank you for joining us. We thank you to the RFA for hosting us, and we'll get started with our show. Okay. So the first person who's going to um, tell us a story this evening is a lovely young lady who um, is a former student. Um, she was known for her ability to pull some really outrageous um, pranks and very jovial. Her laughter was pretty contagious. I know she made a lot of films. My son was kind of the star of some. I remember like a Sasquatch kind of thing. I know. There was a lot of, a lot of um, stories that they spun in film. And um, I secretly hoped that my son would grow keen on her and she could become my daughter-in-law, but I don't know. <laughs> she didn't. And so Miss Heidi Elliott is here tonight, but she's Miss Heidi Bassett. Some other young man won her heart. Welcome, Heidi. And uh, thank you, Sonia, for that lovely introduction. Um, so I will begin my story by saying that it feels like I'm going to barf out my heart because my heart is pounding so fast. But I think now I, like, I'll start calming down and we'll be fine. Um, so when I was a young child, I dreamed of being someone who would be extremely cool. Um, I honestly often envisioned myself riding on a motorcycle, kind of above the law, which I don't know what inspired that. Um, and then I also dreamed of being in a place where I could kind of just be myself and be free. Um, and so that kind of relates to what I kind of eventually became, uh, but not the way I really thought it would. Um, so years pa passed by, I, grad or I didn't graduate college, actually I dropped out of college, um, fun fact. And then I um, decided that I wanted to do something more with my life than just work at the uh, deli, which I was currently um, 
ba basically my biggest thrill in life was when a slice of smoked gouda would land on the slicer, I would pick it up and eat it in the back of the freezer. Um, <laughs> seriously, like that, that was just the thrill. Um, so I yearned for more, um, more in life. And so I started looking at um, places that I could go out of country and I ended up, um, my cousin used to work at this school, it's called Caribbean Mountain Academy. Um, if you look it up online, it has horrible reviews, but that was before the company that I worked for owned it, so it previously actually was like a very bad school, but um, it very much improved. There was no abuse, um, and so yeah, all good on that. But if you look it up online, it actually is like, there's some bad stuff on there. Um, so anyways, I digress. Uh, so I booked my ticket, uh, went through a ton of paperwork, um, which sometimes I was like, do I honestly want to go? Like the paperwork was atrocious, but nonetheless, I got through it. And I found myself at CMA. And so when I first got there, I was honestly terrified. I, so the school is actually, it was a boarding school for troubled American teenagers. So parents would send their kids to this school if they were just having family issues, um, really butting heads, or often like drugs were involved or uh, like attempted suicide sometimes was the case as well. So just like a whole variety of students. Um, so we had counseling and then what my job posi position was, was I was uh, house staff. So I, um, I was going to be living with the students at that time, actually living in the house with them. And I would be making meals, planning activities um, for the evenings and on the weekends. We would usually go on like adventures. So we would go to the beach or go to local waterfall. Um, the surrounding area was actually a lot like Rangeley where you were about like two and a half hours from the coast. So we were in the middle of the island um, or country, I guess Haiti is also the island. But, um, and so um, what, as I said, like I was quite terrified when I started, but as time progressed, I found myself really actually enjoying getting to know the students. I was kind of scared at first because I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, what? how am I qualified? Like, I am a 22-year-old kid who has, I mean, who I actually wasn't that far in age. There wasn't a huge age gap between me and the students. Um, but I did enjoy myself. And there was a lot of great bonding moments that we had with the students. Um, one of the big ones was honestly Christmas because I was missing my family and the students were also missing theirs. And so we had some really good conversations through that. Um, I would say like the hardest thing for me was I didn't know whether to get really close to the students and you kind of like give it your all, you put in all of your emotions, or if you kind of like take the step back, like I'm a professional, I don't really want to make those bonds because you know, the student's going to leave or they're going to do something that would just completely break my heart. Um, and that did happen a couple times where I got really so close to a student and then they would have like a huge breakdown moment. And at one of the cases was that the student actually left. Like they got in a fight with someone. They were just not. And this school wasn't really a like shut down, you know, barbed wire fences. It wasn't that way at all. And so um, the student was actually sent to school that was more like that. Um, so I think one of my favorite moments though was, so I was working with the girls for a while and then um, I started working in the boys house. And one of my favorite moments was one of our students. So he was kind of this like geek, I suppose. Um, he loved superheroes, he would like sketch superheroes in his books and like have little outfits that he would make for him and stuff like I thought it was awesome um, but so me and this kid and another group of boys who these guys were more like hey I'm tough rugged like out in the gym all the time we decided to go down this rapids and so we're all going down there and this the one kid um, who did the superhero stuff literally was screaming like I, I don't even know how it was just like ah! 
going down this mount, uh, this river, and all the other guys are like, oh, whatever. Well, we get to the end, and he's the only one who wants to do it again. Like, he just jumped, and he's like, can we do that? That was awesome. Like, we need to do this again. Um, I was like, okay, yeah, let's, let's go. Um, and then another one of my favorite moments was we do this, well, kind of, um, this hike, so uh, Pico Duarte, which is um, the tallest mountain in the Caribbean, and we go on a five-day hike um, to the top, and it's both um, humbling, really hard, but a lot of fun at the same time. So envision just like 10-ish students with you who do not want to be hiking this mountain, most of them. Uh, some of them do, but a lot of them didn't, and I would always go with the girls, and most of them, you essentially had to like drag up the mountain to get them to go. Or like there was mules that they would take, so we would like throw them on a mule if they really couldn't make it. Um, but that was a really good time. Um, and so, <laughs> I, yeah, I did end up though, so one of my accomplishments in life was I did buy a motorcycle. Um, it wasn't a big one, it was a 200cc, <laughs> if you know anything about motorcycles. Um, and it was some Chinese brand, and so, but I honestly, like when I bought that thing and I would ride that around, it was like, if any of you watch Game of Thrones, it was like Daenerys riding one of her dragons. Like it was just like the coolest, like it was the most freeing thing I um, felt like I could do at that time. So I'm there about like two years at this point, And honestly, I did start getting very stressed about my job. Um, there was just so many, there were so many good things about it but there was also a lot of hard things. Um, it was, you were always on the campus, so it kind of felt like this bubble. And then I had a, I mean, I had a lot of bad experiences with kids who were running away and you kind of have to literally chase them down the jungle. Um, and then there's others who cuss at you and I was really struggling with that. And then also just, I guess the work itself, like I was just feeling very burned out and so at that point, I was going back for a home visit, and I mentally thought, like, if I feel like I want to stay in the States, I'm going to go back to the Dominican, but then I'm going to kind of fade out, like, see if I can um, go back home. And so I get to the States, and I think, the, the, literally the whole time I was missing CMA. I was like, okay, I guess this is a sign that I need to stay. Well, on that flight, so backtrack a little bit, um, my now husband, one of his um, best friends, was working with me at the time. And they kind of had stopped accepting um, people to come for a summer intern, but my now husband, Ben, um, was looking to go. And so his friend, Max, went to the manager and said, you need to get Ben down here because him and Heidi are gonna get married. Um, so, uh, without, us like conversating or anything um ben and i bought the same tickets on the same plane back to the dominican so i was coming home from visiting and he was coming down for the summer and so we met actually at the airport um and it was definitely like i don't know how, how do i describe it um i he he knew day three and I, I was still like, eh, you know, prop maybe, you know, and, and you kind of like passively say something to my mom, like, oh yeah, uh, like all the other interns, you know, I'd be like, uh, nope, mm -mm. but then when his name would come up, I'd be like, he's a nice guy, like, I, I just genuinely think he's a good guy, um, and so things progressed even more, and um, we ended up dating, and um, Man, I wasn't going to tell this, but actually it's funny now that I look back on it. Sorry, Ben. But um, on, our, on our first date, we took our motorcycles to a waterfall, and it was, like, probably the most romantic place you could go on a first date. You know, like, we were literally behind the waterfall or whatever, and we are like, sitting on the cliff, and Ben, like, turns to me to about kiss me, and I was like... 
and I didn't, but then, uh, which is horrible, like, I don't know why I'm trying this right now, but it was, like, really funny to, like, look back on, like, oh, that was funny, but then literally the next day was our first kiss, so I don't know what I was thinking, like, over my head, whatever, but anyways, so I was still, like, th this was still, that was a really, like, big part of how I was able to kind of get by in CMA. I was still feeling very stressed. Um, and even though like things outside of work were going really well, work was still really hard for me. And living down in the Dominican was hard for me. And I felt like I didn't have any, well, I felt like I had friends, but they weren't like my friends. And I don't know, it, I sometimes look back and like, what was I thinking? But um, that's how I felt. And so we were planning, we got engaged, and then we were planning on getting married in the Dominican, but then we quick, quickly realized that a lot of our family, family wouldn't be able to afford to come down. And so we were looking at getting married in the States, and at that point, being back in the States sounded really good to me. And so that's kind of what we ended up doing, was we're like, well, when we get married, then we'll just end up staying in the States. And so I thought about all the time, like, oh, I can't wait to get back to America. And like, I, we were thinking about moving to Maine at that point. And so I was just envisioning like staying in the cabin, like isolation sounded beautiful because I was always surrounded by people there. And like, you always felt like you couldn't escape. Um, and so that is essentially what happened. Um, we left, I left before Ben, Ben stayed a couple uh, months after I did. And now it's, it's weird because it's almost like it's changed. Like the grass is always greener on the other side for me. And so now like I think about, oh man, I have such good friends there. Like the weather was really nice there, especially on days like today where it's really cold. And I just envision like warmth that I used to be in. And I was significantly tanner as well. Um, but anyways, I think also one of the questions that I asked myself is like, I went down to a school that was supposed to change students' lives for the better, and I don't know if like I've changed for the better. Um, I like to think I do, and then there's other days where I'm like, mm -mm, nope, I didn't. Um, so I don't know, still figuring that out, but thank you for listening. So our next presenter is a father of two girls. He was born in South Jersey. He was raised in Rangeley. He works for our local water district. Please welcome Ethan Schaefer. Wow, that's great. So uh, 1998, I graduated high school here. Um, that winter, uh, that winter was a little different for me. It was, uh, I was a pretty depressed guy that winter. I got myself a little too involved in a, in a high school relationship that wasn't really that big of a deal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so if you went to school in Rangeley, you do about a thing called intercession. Now what that was, was, uh, it was a break between February vacation and April vacation, and uh, two lovely people thought that up. Um, Sue Hamilton and Sherry Conley, who are no longer with us, but they thought that up, and uh, they thought it'd be a good time to um, do some interactive things uh, over three days just to break up the monotony. Um, so the things you would do, uh, some kids would go to uh, Paris if you were really motivated, some kids would go to New York if you were kind of motivated, and some kids would stay behind and do projects with Brent Quimby if you weren't really motivated. <laughs> I did a few projects with Mr. Quimby. But, uh, so that particular year, I think uh, Sue and Sherry, maybe some other people could see that I was a little off, and uh, they were like, yeah, you should go to New York with us. And I'm like, 
I didn't do any of the fundraisers. And they're like, hey, you should go. So they kept on it. And uh, one day Sue got me. She was good at that. And she was like, you should go. And I said, well, how much is it? And she said, it's 400 bucks. She goes, but hey, it's a great deal. You get two Broadway shows. You get, you know, uh, you get your meals and the bus trip and the hotel. You should go. I said, how much? She said, 400 bucks. I went to the bank and we went to New York. So uh, we left Rangeley um, on a school bus. And uh, all these other kids, they had been on this trip before. A lot of them had been to places. I really hadn't been that many places. Um, so I was excited. Like, we got on the bus and I was excited. And I, I'm pretty sure I was pretty annoyingly excited. Um, <laughs> and we had some cool chaperones. Um, a lot of them you might know. Carl Blondell, Bob Finley, Sherry and Sue, Martha Nichols, Mike Schrader, uh, a couple other ones we picked up along the way. Um, <laughs> So, so we leave Rangeley, Snowbanks and all, uh, and we end up in Portland at a, a, a tour bus place called the Main Line. It's no longer around, um, but we switched buses, and when we got on that bus, uh, two more chaperones got on. Tammy Wentworth, who was Bob Wentworth's wife at the time, and her uh, brother Stu, and we'll get to Stu later. Um, but... Uh, so we started cruising down the highway, and, and it became evident to me the closer we got to New York, the more excited I was going to get. Um, we crossed state lines, and every state line, it just seemed like it was building. And uh, I remember going through Connecticut and uh, looking up and seeing these letters on this building, WWF. Like, oh, my God, Hulk Hogan lives there. I've been waiting <laughs> to see this all my life. I mean, I'm serious. I don't know that anyone was ex as excited as I was. So uh, we grab something to eat in Connecticut, and uh, we keep cruising down the road. I remember seeing the New York City skyline, and uh, and I remember going past the, the Meadowlands, because we stayed in um, fabulous Elizabeth, New Jersey, because it was too expensive to stay in you know, New York City itself. <laughs> so we went past the Meadowlands, and Carl Blondell pointed it out to me, and I was like, oh, wow. That's, like, that's a sports stadium. I'd never seen one. It was great. So that night, we were getting ready for our first Broadway show. Um, and we got on the tour bus again, under the Lincoln Tunnel. And, uh, and the bus driver's giving us commentary the whole time. And uh, he stops, and we get out. And he goes, here we are, Times Square. And I get out, and it was evening. Of course, it's March, so it's still dark a little early. And I get out of the bus, and I'm in time freaking square. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, ticker, lights, everything. I, like I said, I was excited. I, I don't know if anybody else felt this way, but the, the power of that to me, of seeing all these things that I'd seen on television and heard about in New Year's Eves, and it was there. So while I'm taking this in, we're strolling up to the Needlelander Theater to see this, uh, this play that everybody keeps talking about. I, you might have heard of it. It's called Rent. Um, so we went to see that. And... Uh, I sat down next to Sherry Conley and Bob Fiddley, and the curtains went back. And my mind was blown for the next hour and a half, two hours. This show just, it moved me. It was, um, it talked about issues that I didn't know that I cared about. The songs just hit your chest like a hammer. And when I was done, I had to drink some water because my mouth was so dry it had been open the entire time. It was amazing. <laughs> so we got done. We walked through the receiving line much like we do um, at productions here. The only difference was there was famous people in these lines, people that were on MTV shows, my so-called life, all sorts of stuff, continuously amazed this night. Nothing, nothing could get any more entertaining than this. We get on the bus and I'm feeling really good, and this is incredible. So, we hadn't eaten dinner, per se, so we stopped at a, a bodega in Manhattan to grab some snacks. Now, the plan was we were going to get some cigars, because Ryan Wilbur was 18 years old, and we were going <laughs> to smoke these cigars, and that was going to be our big, you know. But that didn't happen. We got off the bus, and, uh, and we got off the bus, and we looked across the street, and there was this sign in this immense building. Um, it said Trump Tower. <laughs> and, 
And we were like, oh wow, look at this. And Stu, remember Stu? Stu gets off the bus. Now what I didn't say about Stu is he's a, uh, he's a professional photographer. Stu's the nicest guy you'll ever meet. He wants shots of this building. It's a, it's a cool building. You know, he's taking all sorts of shots. Of it. And we're getting ready to go into this bodega, which is a convenience store. Um, but there's a person in front of the building, and Stu's taking the pictures, and this person starts, you know, trying to get his attention. <laughs> so this person starts yelling at him, saying, Hey, my name's Oda Mae Robinson, and you don't take my picture for nothing. Stu had got himself involved in a hustle, and he didn't know it. So Oda Mae is a black woman with a bright pink, shiny leggings on, and she's, she's not letting him get away, and Stu's trying to ignore her. She comes across the street, and she, want, she wants 20 bucks. She wants 20 bucks because nobody takes her picture for nothing, and Stu's, Stu's trying to get her away, so we go in the store, and Stu goes in the store, and we walk to the back of the store. We're looking at sodas, and me and Carl Blondell are standing there looking at sodas. And Stu comes up, he's like, can you believe that? I, he said, yeah, I can't believe that. And, but Oda Mae follows Stu into the store. <laughs> but she didn't come by herself. And we turned around and there was two very, very large men in very long coats and they were not smiling. And she said, you owe me 20 bucks and two Budweiser's. And Stu was like, I'm not buying you anything. Five minutes later, she walked out with two cake-sized Budweiser cans, one with a straw in it, and $20 in her hand, and she said, I told you. And she walked out. <laughs> well, so this Rangely boy got a lesson in a New York hustle, and uh, I hope I catch up with Stu someday to see if he has those photographs. <laughs> so this is all the first night. <laughs> right? So the next day, um, next day, you know, the normal stuff, we head back into the city, we're going to see another play. We're going to see Miss Saigon. And they're telling me, that if, you, if you like last night, you, you won't believe today. So we get there like an hour early. It's raining. We're walking around in circles. We don't have phones to look at because they haven't invented them yet. And Mike Schrader looks at me and goes, let's get out of here. Go get an espresso. Let's find a Starbucks. Okay. So I followed him. It's just me and Mike. We just take off down the street. <laughs> And there's all these other kids, and then Mike's son Victor is like, "How'd you? Where are you guys going? We're, like, we're going to get a coffee." So he went with us, maybe another kid, and we walked around. And Mike told us some stories about the Bowery and about jazz and about it was great. But we come back, and Sherry Conley is losing her freaking mind. <laughs> oh my God! Where have you guys been? And, and Mike pulls a cute car. Eh, we went to get a coffee. You guys can't do that. What are you thinking? Mike? Anyways, <laughs> so so we we go to this show and. Uh, you remember, I really liked the show the night before. So Miss Saigon's a classic. There's a full-size helicopter inside. The theater's immense. But I was ruined because the show the night before was so powerful that I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't take Miss Saigon for what it was that I wish I could have, so maybe I should see it again. Now, all these things that I've seen, that i felt, they're all, they're all churning things up inside me. Um, it was, it was a lot to handle, and I don't know that everybody else felt this way. So, so later that night, uh, they decided to take us to a real Chinese restaurant in Chinatown. And the food really wasn't that good, because we like McDonald's and stuff. And, <laughs> but, so, we met another school from Virginia, and uh, this group of girls wanted to know if we had lobster-flavored ice cream. <laughs> we said no, we probably do, but... Uh, we finished dinner and went outside, and the weird thing was, I think it was Mott Street, because I looked it up. Yes, I don't remember that, but I looked it up. It was Mott Street in uh, Chinatown, and there was like nobody on the street. Now, I know it's March, but this is New York City. But what I do remember is there was one street vendor selling hats that said Brooklyn and FBI and knockoff watches, and so we all bought some of these hats. And one kid got Brooklyn, and he put it on, and... Uh, the other kid got uh, FBI, and I got one that said just Bronx on it. Because all these years watching shows and movies, it just that borough just stood out as the toughest, the, the tough place, and I wanted it, so I grabbed it. We we're posing for pictures in the alley, and, and we were uh, we were from New York for about five minutes. It was great. <laughs> so. Uh, <clears throat> 
the next day comes and um and it's time it's time to go home and i wasn't sure how we were going to do that because all this stimulation here how could we how could we go back to something else how could we how could we be entertained how could we live without all this constant stuff so it was kind of hard to watch the city go away from the bus window and then it was hard to watch each state line go by and then it was harder to watch the snow start to build up as you got into portland <laughs> So it's the middle, you know, it's getting late. I, um, I think it must be midnight by the time we hit Portland and get on the school bus. Then it really sets up. Then we're headed home on a bus that doesn't ride good. <laughs> we're, we're, starting to, we're starting to feel frost heaves, and we don't have a, a bathroom and televisions on our bus anymore. So I remember we're, we're sitting, we're trying to occupy ourselves because we still don't have phones and we're playing games and I remember Victor and I were talking about geez I, I don't want to go home you know I don't. and Victor goes this sucks I don't I don't want to go back to Rangeley and I remember Mike looking at us he got mad at us he's like you know guys there's plenty of time for all this stuff he goes there's things to do in Rangeley that if you want to do them there's thoughts to be thought there's books to be read I don't want to hear you guys complaining you just had a great time he was right but it still didn't change the way we felt. <laughs> so we got home about four in the morning, and uh, three in the morning, it was a Friday night, and we went to bed, or I tried to, you know, with all this. The next morning I remember getting up, and it was snowing. And there was a lot of snow on the ground, it was like March 21st or something. And uh, I got up and my house was quiet, my folks were out working, they did that a lot, they still do. I got myself together and uh, I was trying to process the no, no noise and no people. And I was thinking to myself, uh, I'm different, but I'm not from New York. And I put my, put my clothes on and decided I'd go for a walk. And when I stepped outside, <laughs> I put my hat on and I said, I could be from the Bronx anytime I want. And I walked down the street in Rangeley, Maine. is no stranger to anyone. She is talented beyond belief. She's our local art teacher here at the school. She is mother of two really wonderful kids. And might I just say, a wonderful dancer. Very wonderful dancer. Um, everybody welcome Sonia Johnson, please. comfort zone. I like to be backstage or in the front row or wherever, but not in front of a mic. Anybody that knows me um, can blabber on in front of children, but in front of adults, there's just something about it. It makes me a bunch of squirmish. But... So Tim asked me to do this, and I thought, how do I narrow down a story? I, I don't even know how to begin this. And so I put it off for a long time until the other day. Um, I walk into humanities. Tim and I teach humanities with Mary Mamami at school, and uh, there had been a student issue. And Tim goes, okay, i got to leave the room for a minute. So everything's cued. There's the video about under the sea, and I'm nodding my head, like, uh-huh, yep. Yeah. And then, then there's the video about the little mites that live on your eyelashes and how they take care of all that business up there. And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he, I didn't dare say, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. So I'm like, okay, I got it. And he just went out the door, and I reached into my teacher toolbox and pulled out a story because I, there was no way I was going to figure out what he was talking about. 
So uh, storytelling is a part of teaching. Um, it's the way that we connect with kids. Um, when you feel like you're losing control of a classroom, a good story about the cat gacking on the carpet the night before always reels them in. You know, they, they just can relate to you a little better if you can throw out a good story. So um, my story began in Portland when my daughter was, you know, just a couple of years old. Her godmother lived a few doors down and she had this refrigerator that never quite shut all the way. So I got a phone call one evening and she said, um, you know, pack up rain and come down. I've, I've, got, I've got a little problem that I need you to take a look at. So I thought, okay. And so we trucked down to her apartment and went in and she opened the door and in the crisper drawer was this little critter. I don't know if it was a gerbil or a hamster, but it was this little furry thing and it was munching on the carrots. And I'm like, well, well how the hell did that get in there? She goes, I don't know. That's why I asked you here. There's a critter in my, in my crisper drawer. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I go, it's a see-through thing. It's sort of like an aquarium. And so we snagged the screen, the stretchy screen thing out of the window and put it on the top and voila, you had a pet. And so the only twist was that she said, oh, it's so cute. Here, here you go, Raina, take that home. So I became, I became the owner of this little critter that we, we named Crunchy. So Crunchy became our little pet that, I don't know how long those things live, but it, it lived long enough to move to Rangeley and watch me get married and move to Mingo Loop and just be an ongoing pet. And then Gunner was born and there was Crunchy always in the, you know, the little aquarium. And I, I don't think he ever drank out of the toilet bowl, but I don't remember ever watering him. But anyway, he lived a very long time until, you know, one afternoon I was getting home from school, you know, and doing all the chores, bringing in the firewood, making sure the kids, you know, were kind of content so I could get supper ready. And, and uh, I was vacuuming and I lifted up the little couch skirt and looked under and, uh-oh, there's Crunchy. <laughs> you know, fangs up and I'm like, oh God. <laughs> Oh, poor Crunchy, what are you going to do? So I, the kids were upstairs. I thought, well, it's, you know, it's winter time, and I, I, I'm not going to go out and dig in the snow to bury this thing. And I already had a turtle and a canary in the freezer, so that was not an option. <laughs> so, so I went out on the deck and, you know, gave kind of some kind words, and then, you know, by the tail, and whoop, whoop, woo! And <laughs> circle of life, you know, aerial burial. There goes Crunchy. <laughs> And then I thought, you know, I just won't worry about it. The kids, you know, they came down, and sooner or later they noticed that the aquarium was, was empty. And, Mom, where's Crunchy? And I'm like, oh, you know, Crunchy likes to explore, so I think he just went on a little vacation. I'm sure he'll be back someday. And the kids were like, oh, okay. And they just went about their business, and I'm like, oh, okay, no problem. So it was probably like, a, you know, a few weeks passed, and... I was in the kitchen, we'd been home from school and you know, got the firewood in again, you know, that constant cycle. And I'm at the at the um, sink and I'm washing the dinner dishes, you know, kind of looking out the window at the deer feeding in the backyard, you know, all that beauty that happens when you're washing dishes. And um, I feel a little tug on my on my on my skirt and I turn around and there's, you know, rain and she goes, Mom, Crunchy's home. Well, oh, God, I was washing the dishes. <laughs> I go, Crunchy's home, and I could see my reflection in the glass, and I'm thinking, pet cemetery. And I slowly turn around to make sure that my kids' eyes weren't glowing red. They'd sold their soul and brought Crunchy back from some weird place. But now they were perfectly fine. And I said, Oh, I I'm sure you're just mistaken. She goes, No, come see. And I'm like, Okay, so. We went into the living room and, and we had a coffee table that was kind of a toy chest as well. You know, you throw things in there when guests arrive or whatever. And so we're sitting on the couch and Gunner's on one side and Rain is on the other. And sure enough, this little nose pokes out from underneath that coffee table. And I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> little whiskers. and <laughs> It has to be a mouse. You know, that's not no big deal. And all of a sudden the nose comes out and then two really big eyes and then two weird ears that weren't mouse-like, they're kind of more a little pointy, and then a body, and a white body, and it's getting longer and longer, and I'm like, oh, that's no crunchy, everybody on the couch, and we're standing there watching this really long body. <clears throat> this little ermine had made it into our house, and the well, one was not nifty, no crunchy, but now we have an ermine, okay, so that thing took off, and I don't know if you've ever had a, seen one of them, but they're really slinky, and they get skinny, and they get fat, and they, they just tear around, and, and it was going along the heating vents of the house, and I'm watching it go around, and I'm going, okay, well, let's just catch it, you know, we can, we can handle this. 
Well, that thing reared up on its hind legs when I got near. The, the golden retriever was barking, the kids were all cheering, and it was bright of, of you know, Chucky, that, that thing with fangs. And I'm like, oh, no, we're not keeping this little fella. He's, he's out of here. He's going to go visit. He could go visit Crunchy. We're, we're done with that. <clears throat> so we start chasing this thing around, and then I realized we're in danger. So I got Raina to get the golden retriever outside. I got, I got Gunner and his little pajamas up on the couch, and the cats, who knows? I think they could fend for themselves. So anyways, I'm going, what am I going to do? So I, I decided I need to arm myself. And so I found a little Tykes mini putter, and I had that in one hand. And then I had the um, Harry Potter broom in the other, you know, the, the really cool one that when you hit the button, it goes whoosh. So I had those, and I'm thinking, there, we got it. Now, how are we going to get this little ermine out of the house? And we had some of those cardboard blocks that you build big forts with. So I had this great idea. I'm like, okay, kids, you get those blocks, and you line them up like a maze, right from where that end of that vent is, and we're going to chase that little thing right down that aisle and right out the door. Okay, everybody on board? So we're running around. We get this little ermine going, and he goes down that maze. I'm thinking, I'm so brilliant. Open the door, it's too cold. That damn thing jumped over the maze and he starts it again. So we had to regroup, regroup and we realigned the maze and I made it a little wider, a little taller. And so here I am, kids chasing around. And sure enough, that stupid arm went right down the maze again. But this time, when he got near that, I didn't give him a chance to make a decision. I hit the whoosh button and I boop, and there he went, all white and into the snow and poof, and he's gone. Here's my words of wisdom to you. Don't leave doors open because you don't know who's going to come in and you never know how long they're going to stay. So, thank you. gentlemen our next speaker comes to us uh, in the year 2000 from Montana he's a retired physical therapist um, an avid contributor to the Highlander please uh, welcome Alan Wickham well I know in this crowd there has to be a few fellow Monty Python fans Right? Well, their usual segue is, and now for something completely different. This is completely different from what you've heard so far. But I, I'd like to think that it would be of, of value to a few people. Um, a little bit of history first. I am not a native Mainer. I was born in Montana, grew up there as well as Minnesota. and. Um, in lake country, and so that's why I'm here in Rangeley. Love lakes, love mountains. And uh, the Army, after graduating from college and uh, at Concordia, everybody knows where Concordia is in Minnesota, I'm sure. And, uh, and uh, a couple of years teaching to uh, keep the local draft board at bay. I was finally uh, awarded a very low number, and away I went. And so, there I am in basic training, and thinking the worst is about to come. But I got orders to go to the U.S. Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine in what I thought was Natick M.A. And I thought M.A. meant Maine, so I said, this has got to be good. But it was Massachusetts, but it wasn't, it was almost as good, but not quite. But it was a hell of a lot better than the other options that uh, was taking people away. And I had been on a 10-day canoe trip immediately before uh, the draft board called. And I thought I was a pretty good canoeist, and I was. And uh, I met Judy when I was in Boston uh, at, the, at the Research Institute. And uh, we got married about three months after I was discharged. And we headed down to North Carolina, where I spent a couple of years in graduate school. And I had a job waiting for me when I graduated at Maine Medical Center in Portland. 
And uh, so that's the direction we went, and we had a six-month-old baby in tow. And we began, that was in early May of 74. And that was the first of many Memorial Day weekends at this classic old camp on the, I guess would be east shore of Long Pond in Belgrade Lakes. And everybody here has driven by or through Belgrade Lakes, right? Going to Augusta, going to the mid coast. That's my route of choice going to Portland. It's 10 miles longer than going through Lewiston, but a hell of a, not, a lot nicer ride. And um, because you're on the interstate longer, it's about the same time invested. So we go by there a lot. And memories, some things keep popping up from our almost 20, maybe 21 Memorial Day weekends at this old camp that Judy's, my wife Judy's, mother went to as a little girl who was owned by friends of her parents in eastern Pennsylvania near Philly and they would go up there on vacations and so forth and when Judy was a little girl she would go to this same camp and so there we are in 74 we're in Maine and we talked to the aging owners of, of the camp and we said uh, I know it's getting tougher and tougher to put in the dock and put up the screens and do all the other things to get the camp ready for where, when you're coming uh, to uh, Belgrade Lakes later in the summer. And so we kind of struck that deal. They were thrilled that we would do the housekeeping uh, on Memorial Day weekend and stay there for three days. And, and that went on for, uh, and our oldest son, who was only probably 12 weeks old at the time, um, that was his first of about 20 in a row Memorial Day weekends on Long Pond. One of the best memories of going to Long Pond was putting their classic 1927 Old Town wooden canvas canoe in the water and paddling down to Day's store for their homemade donuts. You haven't eaten a donut unless you have eaten one of Day's homemade donuts. They had a machine in the back, they had a couple of kids during the summer that were making donuts, and everybody went there to get the donuts in the bag with the stains that indicate freshness. <laughs> I and the boys, I and the boys would paddle down uh, today's store, get a half a dozen donuts. Uh, not all of them made it back to the camp, but half of them did. And that was kind of the dessert for our breakfast. And uh, that was kind of a treasured thing. So that went on for about five years. I think it was about in 1980 or 81, the boys were maybe five and seven years old. And that Memorial Day weekend was really, really cold and blustery and rainy and windy. And it just was one of those Memorial Days that non-stop bad weather it seemed and I got up early the first morning I think it was when we were there that year and uh, everybody else is sleeping kind of day you want to just stay in bed and but I like to get up early and the lake was pretty choppy there were some white caps and I thought you know I think I can go down there today store by myself in the canoe and uh, get those donuts and bring them back and all will be well. Everybody else will start getting out of bed at that time and we will continue our ritual. Well, this is where if, if you have a pencil and paper with you, start jotting down my mistakes. <laughs> we'll see who has the longest list. So I go down on the dock this Classic 1927 Old Town canoe was lashed to the to the dock and uh, turned over, and so I'm trotting down the little boardwalk down to the dock with my paddle and my seat cushion with the two loops, which most people figured was good enough life jacket for 
what was coming. And I, at that time, was probably in about 34, 35. I was still a, a pretty, a pretty uh, rugged athlete. I was a regular runner. This is an important point. Jot that down because it will come back as important a little later. And I kind of still thought that I could do anything. I really, I can handle this. I've canoed the boundary waters of Minnesota, uh, Quetico Provincial Park in, uh, in uh, Ontario and so forth and, and other places. And, and I, I know what I'm doing with a canoe. So I put the canoe in the water. The wind is blowing, it's raining, it's cold. And there are occasional white caps. So, you know, 18 inch waves kind of on average. I put the canoe in on the lee side of the, of the dock and hanging onto the dock, I get into one of the cane seats and I endeavor to back out into the water with the canoe, back paddling for a bit until I could swing the canoe around and if I could get the bow into the wind, I should be able to make it down to Day's store and those delicious donuts, no problem. Well, backing out, getting away from the dock was okay, but it was really a challenge trying to turn the boat in the direction of the wind. I should also mention, and take out your pencils, that I was wearing my old hiking boots with the Vibram soles, about that thick jeans, a heavy wool shirt, and a rain jacket, and whatever else. And I'm trying to dig into the water deep with that paddle to swing that bow around, and it wasn't happening. And at one particular deep dig with that paddle, particularly big wave, I think, hit the canoe. It flipped enough to throw me out, but the canoe stayed upright. And the first thing I thought of was, oh God, I can't let anything happen to that canoe. That was, that was number one in my mind. And so I'm hanging under the canoe, the wind is taking us down the lake, and it's a pretty rocky coast, a coastline, shoreline, uh, just like most of the lakes around here. And I was worried about <clears throat> us ending up in the rocks with that canoe and how am I going to explain this and so forth. And there was a sandy stretch that we came up. It kind of probably went downstream about 200 yards or so. So <clears throat> I decided to work my way to the stern of the canoe and I gave it one hell of a shove so that it could make it onto the sand that was maybe, you know, 20 feet away, 25. And I was successful. The canoe made it onto the sand. And so next step was, I will follow by swimming to shore. And all of a sudden I realized that I was sinking and I couldn't move. I was trying to swim but it was like I was wearing an anchor. I was going down and I was, I guess uh, I thought, well, okay. we'll see just how far over my head this is. And I was thinking, I, I mean, I was already saying, this is it. This is the end of me. And uh, I went down, felt the bottom, I was probably, I figured, a foot to 18 inches over my head, the depth. So the only thing I could think to do at that time, down there underwater, was to get down into as deep a squat as I could and spring up and see if I could make it back up to get another breath of air, springing up generally in the direction of the shore. And I made it. 
I got that breath of air, I probably ended up about <clears throat> a foot closer to shore than I started, but it was closer. I took another breath, I went down, did that deep squat, sprang up to the surface, another breath, and I probably did that seven or eight times before I reached a point where I could stand on the bottom and get a breath. And I walked the rest of the way to shore. Thank God. This is probably my closest near-death experience I've ever had, and I certainly don't want to repeat it. Now, if you were keeping track of the mistakes that I made, you know that there's at least a half a dozen. It was dumb. Every one of them was dumb, how I was dressed. Going out there by myself in that weather was the first stupid thing. But at least I was alive and the canoe was in great shape. <laughs> so, it's cold. I'm soaking wet. I pull the canoe up onto shore, it was kind of woodsy there, and I got it up into the woods, turned it over, and I was getting really cold. I walked up to Route 27 across a couple of lawns, it was probably a couple hundred yards up to the, to the highway, walked towards town to the driveway where we were, walked down, got in the cabin, there's an old Atlantic wood stove in the kitchen, cook stove. So I started a fire as fast as I could to try to warm up. I got that going. I was rattling around making a lot of noise. And while I was waiting for the stove to heat up, I decided, well, I've got to find some dry clothes. I rummaged around and found a duffel bag, got some stuff out. And I started laying out all the contents of my wallet on the dining room kitchen table. It was all one almost, a small place. And I'm laying them all out in rows to dry out all the contents. And Judy, my wife, uh, gets up and she comes out and says, What are you doing? What, what happened? You're soaked. And I, I kind of shrugged it off. I said, yeah, I made a mistake. I was going to go down, paddle down to Day's store and flip the canoe, got wet. The canoe's okay. I'm okay. I just need to dry out. It took me a year to tell her how close I came to losing it all in that lake. But it was the next year when we went back to Belgrade Belgrade Lakes. We had, we're using the canoe again. Took the boys a couple of days, a couple of mornings to Day's store. And around that table, I told them all what exactly happened. I wanted them to know how much one really should respect the lake and the weather conditions and how you approach being on the water in a boat. And so, to my knowledge, I know since then, the ensuing almost five decades since that happened, uh, I have never, and I love to paddle, love to kayak, love to canoe. If you read my column, you know that the 14th annual canoe trip with Peter Christensen is coming up this summer, and we're already planning where the heck we're going to go that we haven't been. And so it's still a big part of my life, but since that day, I have never been in a canoe or a kayak without a life jacket. And, uh, and I trust that that has been the case with our sons as well. I mean, when they would go to day store with me, they always had life jackets on. But of course, I didn't need one. And, uh, but I did need one. And so I think that was a, a good lesson for them. And... Uh, in conclusion, I never did get the donuts that day. That was kind of secondary to the whole thing. We kind of forgot about them. And uh, 
So we have, we have uh, been life jacket wearers ever since. I don't go out in a canoe with anybody else that doesn't have one on. And uh, there was a lesson there. And so I'm hoping that that little story of my stupidity laid out totally bare uh, at that time anyway, uh, will maybe do some good for somebody's grandchild or, or yourselves or whatever, because it was, it was a lesson uh, that I learned. When I saw it, when Tim announced that he was doing these table talks, and many of you know that I've probably written 250 columns in the Rangeley Highlander since I started in 2003. Um, you know, I've got a lot of stories to tell and have told. Uh, but this one was the one that came to my mind instantly. And I called Tim and I said, I got a story I'd like to share. Um, and so I kind of gave him a, a Cliff's Notes version of this, and he said, sounds good. So I think that's it, except I think we have three slides uh, that I took a few days ago in our garage. My oldest son, who was only probably 12 weeks old at the time, um, that was his first of about 20 in a row Memorial Day weekends on Long Pond. One of the best memories of going to Long Pond was putting their classic 1927 Old Town wooden canvas canoe in the water and paddling down to Day's store for their homemade donuts. You haven't eaten a donut unless you have eaten one of Day's homemade donuts. They had a machine in the back, they had a couple of kids during the summer that were making donuts and everybody went there to get the donuts in the bag with the stains that indicate freshness. <laughs> I and the boys, I and the boys would paddle down uh, today's store, get a half a dozen donuts. Uh, not all of them made it back to the camp, but half of them did. And that was kind of the dessert for our breakfast. And uh, that was kind of a treasured thing. So that went on for about five years. I think it was about in 1980 or 81, the boys were maybe five and seven years old. And that Memorial Day weekend was really, really cold and blustery and rainy and windy. And it just was one of those Memorial Days that was nonstop bad weather, it seemed. And I got up early the first morning, I think it was, when we were there that year. And uh, everybody else is sleeping, kind of day, you want to just stay in bed. And, but I like to get up early. And the lake was pretty choppy. There were some white caps. And I thought, you know, I think I can go down there to today's store by myself in the canoe and uh, get those donuts and bring them back and all will be well. Everybody else will start getting out of bed at that time, and we will continue our ritual. Well, this is where, if, if you have a pencil and paper with you, start jotting down my mistakes. <laughs> we'll see who has the longest list. So I go down on the dock. This classic 1927 Old Town canoe is lashed to the to the dock and uh, turned over. And so I'm trotting down the little boardwalk down to the dock with my paddle and my seat cushion with the two loops, which most people figured was good enough life jacket for what was coming. And I at that time was probably in about 34, 35, I was still a, a pretty, a pretty uh, rugged athlete. I was a regular runner. This is an important point. Jot that down because it will come back as important a little later. And I kind of still thought that I could do anything. I really, I can handle this. I've canoed the boundary waters of Minnesota, uh, Quetico Provincial Park in. Uh, 
in uh, Ontario and so forth and, and other places. And, and I, I know what I'm doing with a canoe. So I put the canoe in the water. The wind is blowing, it's raining, it's cold. And there are occasional white caps. So, you know, 18 inch waves kind of on average. I put the canoe in on the lee side of the, of the dock and hanging onto the dock, I get into one of the cane seats and I endeavor to back out into the water with the canoe, back paddling for a bit until I could swing the canoe around and if I could get the bow into the wind, I should be able to make it down to Day's store and those delicious donuts, no problem. Well, backing out, getting away from the dock was okay, but it was really a challenge trying to turn the boat in the direction of the wind. I should also mention, and take out your pencils, that I was wearing my old hiking boots with the Vibram soles, about that thick jeans, a heavy wool shirt, and a rain jacket, and whatever else. And I'm trying to dig into the water deep with that paddle to swing that bow around, and it wasn't happening. And at one particular deep dig with that paddle, particularly big wave, I think, hit the canoe, it flipped enough to throw me out, but the canoe stayed upright. And the first thing I thought of was, oh God, I can't let anything happen to that canoe. That was, that was number one in my mind. And so I'm hanging onto the canoe, the wind is taking us down the lake, and it's a pretty rocky coast, a coastline, shoreline, uh, just like most of the lakes around here. And I was worried about <clears throat> us ending up in the rocks with that canoe and how am I going to explain this and so forth. And there was a sandy stretch that we came up. It kind of probably went downstream about 200 yards or so. So <clears throat> I decided to work my way to the stern of the canoe and I gave it one hell of a shove so that it could make it onto the sand that was maybe, you know, 20 feet away, 25. And I was successful. The canoe made it onto the sand. And so next step was, I will follow by swimming to shore. And all of a sudden I realized that I was sinking and I couldn't move. I was trying to swim but it was like I was wearing an anchor. I was going down and I was, I guess uh, I thought, well, we'll see just how far over my head this is. And I was thinking, I, I mean, I was already saying, this is it. This is the end of me. And uh, I went down, felt the bottom, I was probably, I figured, a foot to 18 inches over my head, the depth. So the only thing I could think to do at that time, down there underwater, was to get down into as deep a squat as I could and spring up and see if I could make it back up to get another breath of air, springing up generally in the direction of the shore. And I made it. I got that breath of air. I probably ended up about <clears throat> a foot closer to shore than I started, but it was closer. I took another breath. I went down, did that deep squat, sprang up to the surface, another breath. And I probably did that seven or eight times before I reached a point where I could stand on the bottom and get a breath. And I walked the rest of the way to shore. 
thank God. This is probably my closest near-death experience I've ever had, and I certainly don't want to repeat it. Now, if you were keeping track of the mistakes that I made, you know that there's at least a half a dozen. It was dumb. Every one of them was dumb, how I was dressed, going out there by myself in that weather was the first stupid thing. But at least I was alive and the canoe was in great shape. <laughs> so, it's cold. I'm soaking wet. I pulled the canoe up onto shore, it was kind of woodsy there, and I got it up into the woods, turned it over, and I was getting really cold. I walked up to Route 27 across a couple of lawns. It was probably a couple hundred yards up to the, to the highway. Walked towards town to the driveway where we were. Walked down, got in the cabin. There's an old Atlantic wood stove in the kitchen, cook stove. So I started a fire as fast as I could to try to warm up. I got that going. I was rattling around making a lot of noise. And while I was waiting for the stove to heat up, I decided, well, I've got to find some dry clothes. I rummaged around and found a duffel bag, got some stuff out. And I started laying out all the contents of my wallet on the dining room, kitchen, table. It was all one almost, a small place. And I'm laying them all out in rows to dry out all the contents. And Judy, my wife, uh, gets up and she comes out and says, what are you doing? What, what happened? You're soaked. And I, I kind of shrugged it off. I said, yeah, I made a mistake. I was going to go down, paddle down to Day's store and Flipped the canoe, got wet, canoe's okay, I'm okay, I just need to dry out. It took me a year to tell her how close I came to losing it all in that lake. But it was the next year when we went back to Belgrade, Belgrade Lakes, we had, were using the canoe again, Took the boys a couple of days, a couple of mornings to Day's store. And around that table, I told them all what exactly happened. I wanted them to know how much one really should respect the lake and the weather conditions and how you approach being on the water in a boat. And so, to my knowledge, I know since then, the ensuing almost five decades since that happened, uh, I have never, and I love to paddle, love to kayak, love to canoe. If you read my column, you know that the 14th annual canoe trip with Peter Christensen is coming up this summer, and we're already planning where the heck we're going to go that we haven't been. And so it's still a big part of my life, but since that day, I have never been in a canoe or a kayak without a life jacket. And, uh, and I trust that that has been the case with our sons as well. I mean, when they would go to day store with me, they always had life jackets on. Of course, I didn't need one. And, uh, but I did need one. And so I think that was a, a good lesson for them. And uh, in conclusion, I never did get the donuts that day. That was kind of secondary to the whole thing. We kind of forgot about them. And uh, so we have, we have uh, been life jacket wearers ever since. I don't go out in a canoe with anybody else that doesn't have one on. And uh, there was a lesson there. And so I'm hoping that that little story of my stupidity laid out totally bare uh, at that time anyway, uh, will maybe do some good for somebody's grandchild or, or yourselves or whatever because it was, it was a lesson uh, that I learned. When I saw it, when Tim announced that he was doing these table talks, 
And many of you know that I've probably written 250 columns in the Rangeley Highlander since I started in 2003. Um, you know, I've got a lot of stories to tell and have told. Uh, but this one was the one that came to my mind instantly. And I called Tim and I said, I got a story I'd like to share. Um, and so I kind of gave him a, a Cliff's Notes version of this and he said, sounds good. So I think that's it, except I think we have three slides uh, that I took a few days ago in our garage because about 15 years ago, uh, when that property was being sold off, I managed to buy that old canoe. It's hanging in our garage safely through the winter. <clears throat> and so... Have you shown all three? Just to give you a little bit of the workmanship on the bow, and the Old Town uh, logo there from 1927. Can you go through the others uh, quickly? And that's it hanging in the garage, 18-footer. It's an absolutely gorgeous canoe. It's totally restored. And that's what I was trying to preserve. It wasn't until later that I thought about myself. So, true confessions here. Thank you. Okay, so right now what we're going to do is let you take a break. We'll do a little intermission at the facilities, get a drink and some snacks, and then we'll reconvene. We have three more speakers for you when you come back. Thank you. about musicals in a small town. Uh, the men are hard to come by as far as filling in our roles. And so taking on the directorship, I was, the day of um, auditions, I was going, oh God, please send me men. <laughs> I felt like he hasn't heard that <laughs> um, I was like, please, I mean, this is such a great musical, but the women really just can't dance by themselves. It just won't happen. And so um, the day I look out and there's a handsome young man out there. And he brought a beautiful young lady with him. I'm like, thank you, God, I can't believe this. So Sam had just brought his lovely wife here to try out and um, come to find out he got hustled up onto the stage and was singing and dancing and could speak. And I was like, oh gosh, this is great. And now he's pretty much ingrained in the community. That's what happens when we move to Rangeley. So Sam um, comes from Montana. 
um, he has a background in music, obviously, and you will see him um, performing at uh, the Thai um, food restaurant, what's it called, the Blue Orchid, Blue Orchid. Um, quite often doing some jazz gatherings, and you'll see him at, at the Congregational Church from time to time. Um, but he's a great gift to our community and a wonderful storyteller, uh, Sam Meehan. Okay, well, you can all uh, sing along if you recognize it. Um, who, who knew that song? Ave Maria. Oh, yeah, Ave Maria. Everybody knows Ave Maria, right? Um, and Vic knows Ave Maria. Uh, it's a great song. It's something that I think probably everybody knows, right? Um, it's super comfortable. It feels good. You know where it's going. You know what to expect. Um, it's just nice. It just feels good. And I, uh, as Sonia kind of alluded to, I have a history of music. I went to school for music. Um, music education particularly, and I, in music education, as you're going into your um, years through college, there's, you do things with music like recitals. You have to give recitals to present what it is that you've learned and what you're doing. Um, and that's an example of something that you would probably expect to hear something similar uh, in a recital when you're going to see somebody play. Um, it's something that's pretty, it feels good, it's classical sounding, right, that, that classical term. Um, and so my instructor, who is the head of the department, uh, Dr. Timothy Justice, what a man, um, he's from Louisiana and he was kind of crazy, but he had two, is a philosophy of performance, and two uh, different tasks that you were supposed to impart on the audience as a performer. One would be that they would leave with an overwhelming sense of satisfaction in the performance. And your face right there? I see that, that's nice. Um, uh, an overwhelming sense of satisfaction, too, uh, would be uh, complete and utter outrage. <laughs> uh, which I thought, okay, that's pretty extreme. Uh, but I, I kind of like the idea that he was getting at with that, is that the, the whole idea as a performer is to... Uh, it evokes some sort of response out of the, the listener, the audience member. And so when we were going through and trying to pick repertoire for my recital, uh, we got into it and we were picking things from different eras and uh, you know different times and everything. And it was all kind of sounding nice and you know some were faster and some were slower, but it all kind of had that classical feel. And so when we got into it, we started talking about um, a study in something called multiphonics, which you may not have heard that tone uh, or that word. Some some may have, but the uh, the whole idea is if you break it down, multi multiple phonics sounds, making multiple sounds at one time with your instrument. And I thought, oh, well, that would certainly be different, um, and maybe get a little bit of a response out of uh, the audience. And so we started looking and we found an, uh, an etude, a study in multiphonics that was kind of turned into a song. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit of a, a sample of that. performed that, uh, that piece, it was called Impressions of Brighton, that was just a little snippet of different parts, but um, when I performed that, I, I gave my audience 
a heads up. I said, hey, this is going to be really different uh, from everything else that you're going to hear tonight. Uh, it's going to sound a little alien. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. It's going to be a little dissonant. Um, and I went in and I played it. And the thing that's that's really funny to me is there in the front corner there were about like eight high school students um, and as I was playing it they out loud were laughing the entire time uh, and it's something that a lot of people came up to me afterwards and they're like I'm so sorry about that that was so rude of those kids to be laughing that was so inappropriate and I honestly thought it was fantastic because I did my job I, I looked at it and I said, man, they don't know what to do with themselves. They're <laughs> laughing. And that, and that is something that I do all the time. I laugh at the most inappropriate times. It's really terrible, actually. Um, but I thought, how great was that, you know? And so uh, you might think that this whole little speech that I'm up here giving, this little story, is, is about music. But realistically, for me, it's actually uh, music is, uh, is a tool for me. It's something that I use to relate uh, to pretty much everything, which I imagine actually, whether it's on a conscious or a subconscious level, most of you probably do too. Um, music is just that kind of unspoken universal language for everybody. And um, for me, I relate it, I use it to kind of understand life uh, um, a lot. So uh, that was one instance where I was kind of pushing myself out of my comfort zone in doing it literally with music. Um, another one most recently was when my wife Kelsey and I moved here. <laughs> um, that was uh, super weird for us. We were both uh, born and raised in the Midwest and um, all of our family is there and everything and, and never once, are you kidding? I, I had no idea this place even existed. Um, I, I would have never imagined that I was, I was coming out here. Um, and it was, it was one of those things that was... Um, really uncomfortable and really sudden, but I feel very strongly that the things that make us uncomfortable are the things that define us and the things that make us grow as, as human beings. Um, and so the whole aspect of um, doing something different, doing something outside of your comfort zone, um, it, it was super important. And it came with huge rewards. Uh, my wife and I work together now, so I see her all the time. Whereas before, uh, we were working in the retail industry and we'd you know, work 50, 60 hours a week and opposite shifts and you see one another maybe when you go to bed and when you wake up and you, you know, maybe don't actually have a conversation for three weeks. Um, and so it, it was really incredible for, for us and our relationship that we now, we spend every day together, which nobody's died yet. Um, and it seems to be going well. So I, I'm really enjoying that. It's, it's also uh, given me an opportunity to, to, to reinvest myself in my, uh, in my passion, which is, which is in the arts and the music. I, I never really had a great opportunity when you're working nights and weekends, you don't really get a chance to do that. So um, it's been really, really rewarding taking the risk and taking the leap and, and living with the, uh, the discomfort or the unknown. And uh, I mean, you know, the, that growth, personal growth, it doesn't come without pain um, or kind of a, an underlying discomfort, right? There's, uh, we left all of our friends and family um, back, they're several days away as far as a drive. And so do we get to see them? Not really. Do we talk to them as much as we want? Probably not because we're all super busy. Um, so it's just something to think about. There's, there's something in embracing the unknown that just, once you let go, it feels good. And good things happen. I think you find out that you land where you should be when you decide to let the wind go. So take that dissonance, take those uh, chords that sound a little funky, and, uh, and embrace them, and then live your life. Thank you.
Yeah, I think this will suit our next speaker. So our next storyteller, um, I met many years ago, um, and she's been a joy to, to know, and I think many of you have encountered her presence, whether it's at our school, our church, and our community. Um, she's a very passionate, uh, creative person who raised some truly incredible children um, and lives in a house of music. And I always thought it was like Wonderland when I went there, there were puppets and it just was just felt so wonderful to be in their presence in the Schrader household. Um, but she has brought so much magic to our children. She has the biggest heart from donning whiskers as Dr. Seuss to out planting um, peace pinwheels in our community. Um, she brings to our heart and to our minds a lot of um, topics in our world that we really need to contemplate to be the kind of wonderful human beings that we can be. So I'm really, really honored to introduce Shirley Schrader, our next storyteller. Thank you, Sonia. That was, oh, goodness. So, um, I'd like you to meet a few people, and I think they're going to come up on the screen. So, I'd like to introduce you to Serafino Valuki and Elisabetta Valuki. Uh, these are my grandparents. The way the story goes, that is in the year uh, was 1908, and Serafino uh, left his little village of Compli in the region of Abruzzo in Italy um, to come to America, as most immigrants do, to find the space to dream and the opportunities to make those dreams come true. Um, he came to Ellis Island, he arrived in Ellis Island, and then made his way to a little borough outside of the Philadelphia area called Downingtown, where other Italians from the Abruzzo region had settled. He, we're not sure, but we think that uh, Rosina Pincianini was also an immigrant in that borough that he met and fell in love with, Mary. They had a child three years later a little boy named Albert, and when Albert was four years old, uh, Rosina passed away from pneumonia. So Serafino was left with a four-month-old son in this new world, and uh, I think he didn't feel uncomfortable. He didn't feel comfortable, so he made his way back to Compli with his son, and found Rosina's sister, who was Elisabetta and had to tell her of the death of her sister, and also ask if she would care for their four-month-old son because he was going off uh, in the Italian army to fight in the First World War. She, uh, loving her sister that much, uh, accepted that challenge and took the four-month-old baby and kept him until Serafino returned from the war at that point, he asked her to come to America with him and his son, which she did, and they went back to the little borough in Downingtown uh, and married and had six children, one of them being my mother. We, my mother also had six children. My mother and my father uh, lived in the duplex in the house with uh, my grandparents. Actually, that's our yard on the other side of the, on the other side of the fence. Uh, so there were six of us over there, and um, my grandparents didn't speak a word of English. We, my parents did, but we didn't. Um, my parents spoke Italian. But we had no idea what they were talking about ever. We spent a lot of time with grandma and grandpa because every time my parents, my mother was going to the hospital to have a new baby, um, we would just go down the steps from our house and stay with grandma and grandpa. And I remember uh, my sisters and I lying on the floor under the kitchen table, which was a very large, long table for Sunday meals, and staring at 
Elisabetta, as she would sit just like that at a, a white enamel table by the window in the kitchen, a small table where she would do her cooking and her chopping and all the things she did to prepare her meals. But some, often she would sit there and just stare out that window and we would stare at her, not being able to talk to her um, and wonder what she was, what she was thinking about, where her thoughts were, where her heart was. Um, we never knew, we would make up stories about it. Uh, fast forward to 2017, two of my sisters and myself decide to go on a trip to Abruzzo to see where my parents, where my grandparents came from. Um, the tour that we went on and the trip that we went on was a 10-day all-women's expedition um, that took us to uh, Compli and uh, in, a, in, a, in a farm building uh, at the foot of Mayela Mountain, Mother Mountain. And um, this trip was unlike any other where, where what we did was hike and hike and hike and hike into the mountains every day. We just wake up at four o'clock with the crows, the roosters crowing, stick a couple of sprigs of lavender behind our ear, um, get some breakfast, and we would get in a rickety old van that took us down the mountain and we would start to hike and we'd hike all day. And I'm sure if we were there for 10 days and I'm sure we ate the most delicious food that Italy has to offer. It was just not the thing that I was most aware of. It was the beautiful rolling hills, the acres and acres of, 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 of just um, grasses and, and um, wooded farmland and saffron fields and olive groves. Uh, that's what sticks in my mind. That's where they came from. That's where, where they grew up. I, I often think that then I knew what she was thinking about when my grandmother was looking out the window into that tiny little yard that she had to live in now. She came from this beautiful place. Uh, when our trip was over, uh, we had to make our way out. Abruzzo, I'm sorry, Abruzzo is in the middle of uh, Italy and it, it's uh, the same latitude as uh, Rome and it extends as far as the Adriatic Sea. So we had to get from, from that region back to Rome to get our flight home. And we had part of a day uh, to spend some time uh, before we got on our flight. And I had never been to um, the Vatican before, but my sisters had. And they said they would indulge me and we could go there. They had already done it. They didn't. It was okay. And I, I was just terribly excited. So we made our way to the Vatican, and there, there weren't a lot of people in the plaza. Usually, well, pictures that I had seen, there would be hundreds and hundreds of people. This day, there were not many, maybe a hundred, a few more. Um, we did know that there is a dress code. Knees and shoulders needed to be covered. I was covered. I had a t-shirt on that came, covered my shoulders. We had pants on, so we were all good that way. But both of my sisters had shirts that just came right to the edge of their shoulders. It didn't hang over like mine. But it was they were pretty modest, and we didn't think we'd have any trouble. So we get in the line. We pass um, the first guard who has to tell us that it's okay. You're okay. You can move on. We move on to the second guard, and he pushes us on. Uh, gives us the thumbs up. We get to the third guy who's standing right at the entrance of the the um, cathedral there, the Vatican, and he puts his hand out and stops my sisters, taps me on the shoulder and shushes me on. Um, I'm, I'm stunned. I, I don't know what to do. I take a few steps forward and I'm standing in the light that's pouring in in the uh, in the windows and uh, it's it's absolutely gorgeous and it's pulling me in but I had decided a long time ago that uh, this trip was going to end uh, with the three of us going into the Vatican not just me um, 
but I had to figure out how that was going to happen. So I, I'm standing there, and they're saying, just go, go, Shirley, go. We'll wait in the, in the courtyard. We'll be fine. Just go. Um, I, I couldn't do it. I started to cry. I turned around, and uh, I made... I thought, well, if I could talk to this guy, we could kind of have a conversation. But just like I couldn't talk to my grandmother, I, I also couldn't have a conversation with this person. Um, but then I did remember that even though we couldn't talk to our grandmother, we felt so very loved and, and safe and understood with her because of something that a love that was that was there between us. So I I tried to channel that feeling when I turned and looked at this scar, and I have tears coming down my eyes, and I engage him. I'm doing this deliberately. I, I engage him. We make eye contact. I don't take my eyes off of him. I walk towards my sisters. I take both of their hands in my hands, and. I, I'm still looking at him, and he looks back, he's looking at all of us, and he says, andare, go, andare, and shushes us on. So the three of us turn and walk into that beautiful place together as sisters uh, in, in, in the spirit of, of Elisabetta and Rosina, um, and, and then we turn around and all say what we should say it is grazie and and continue to go into the Vatican. Thank you. He can figure it out. So um, next to the program, you'll see that we had Anna Shirley, um, um, who was going to join us, but she decided to sit in the audience to see what this is all about. And I think she's probably stockpiling some pretty good stories as she's watching, so she'll join us hopefully next time. Um, our next storyteller is um, um, a gentleman that you met earlier. Uh, again, I had um, my knowledge of him was initially working at the school. He was definitely a champion for um, many of the students that he encountered, um, a lot of the more difficult ones, and he was there to be their coach, their mentor, um, just to be a voice for them, an advocate, um, which stuck with many of them, and they still recall him when they, when they share stories. Um, he's still teaching, um, and you can, we have uh, a little banter, you know, any teacher knows you have to have two or three jobs around here, but we, we, tend, we work together sometimes at Moose Alley, and, you know, when it's my most frantic, his most frantic, we just look at each other and just start laughing. We, we really have a good bond and camaraderie. And as much as he thinks I'm a great dancer, I think he's a wonderful singer. So welcome to the stage, Bill Oliveri. <laughs> You'll know why I'm laughing a little bit, I hope. Um, first of all, I just want to clarify one thing, that when we do work at the alley, I work. She rides on my coattails. <laughs> Let's just start with that. So, the purpose of my story tonight is to explain to you what I learned. It's the things that you think you know that you really don't know, and you learn as you go. So, I'm the only boy with three older sisters, mother and father. The only boy, the baby, my life was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, great. And growing up, my dad was teaching me how to play football. And our life was about football. That's all we did, every day, day in, day out. And I was going to be a big star. And, we, you know, we just kept tripping along and practicing and practicing. And, and then I got into Pee Wee's and Dad had me as a coach. And, you know, the, again, this was our life. And 
all of a sudden, I'd say about nine or ten years old, uh, my parents split. My dad was gone. And he became um, non-existent. So here I am at 10, moving into 11, and you know this, this, whole, this whole sunrise is gone for me, and I have to figure out how to be a man. I gotta figure out girls, booze, smoking, puberty. I got no clue, but I got three older sisters and a mother. <laughs> That's where it all fell apart. <laughs> And that was my first lesson, was that I realized looking back at it now that there's no guarantees in life. So you, you just can't invest all your eggs in that one basket. So I move along through junior high, and, I, and I'm learning, and I'm figuring out, and I'm asking buddies questions, and my coaches questions, and I'm trying to put the pieces together. And then my mother marries or meets this guy who became my stepdad. And him and I were just button heads all the time. I, you know, now I'm into high school, I've raised myself pretty much for four or five years. And I'm like, who are you to tell me how to raise my, you know, how to run my life now? So this went on forever and ever and ever and ever. And this conflict, somewhere along the lines with this conflict, my mother and my brother-in-law decided they were gonna get me the fastest production car made that year. And they bought me a Mustang. That was the second time in my life where it all went really bad. Um, like I was the 70s version of James Dean, you know, t-shirts, cigarettes. I was just a wreck. So we go through high school and I graduate. Don't know how, but I did. And I said, I'm going to go tame the world. I had a couple of scholarships to go to college, play football. And I said, nope, I can do this. And I took off, traveled to Indiana, spent four years in Queens, did some time in New Hampshire, just bounced all over the place. And it's like, just I was just unhappy. So finally I said, geez, i got to go back home. So I called my mom. I said, Mom, can I come back home? And she puts my stepdad on the phone. I'm like, oh, great. And I said, Donnie, I'm tired of this. Can I come back home? He said, yeah. That's all he said. So I moved back home. And he gets me a job in construction, and we travel every day together. We travel and travel, day and night, night and day. We do this for three years. A big project up in East Milwaukee. It was a rebuild of a paper machine. It went on forever. So... As time went on, he decided he was going to retire. And when he retired, it was within two weeks after he got sick. He had cancers, so he ended up taking a lung, then half another lung. And as he comes out of the hospital, he's going to go into a home. We get him to the home. Two hours later, he looks at me and says, Phil, I can't stay here. It was horrible. And I knew he couldn't. And I said to mom, we're going to take him home. She said, I can't take care of him. I said, I'll help you. So I moved in. I had uh, my wife and three, three daughters at the time. And I moved down to the house. We had a house on the lake. But I got it so that she could take care of him. So it took us about a month uh, of helping her and getting him comfortable. And then they were okay. And I moved back home. Made it through the summer. Had a beautiful summer. Into the fall, he and I were able to do some hunting which we love to do together. And by this time, my mother had put her foot down and said, if you two don't get this straightened out, you're killing me. And our love of her brought us together. So here we are in the fall, and then that fall he passed away. And here was my second reckoning that I realized I was, I was saying goodbye, I was burying my best friend. And I never knew it, so I go for this seven year stretch that I have this best friend and I don't even know it. So I'm, I'm heartbroken at this time, but my mom decides I'm gonna sell the house on the lake, she's gonna to move to Connecticut with my sisters. That's okay. So she goes to Connecticut, I'm living in East Millinocket, and I'm kind of selfish at this point because I'm thinking, this is good. I don't have to take care of mom, I don't have to take care of the house on the lake, I'm going to take a breather. And it was truly selfish. And, and I, you know, looking back, you know these things. 
So every birthday we call each other. You know, every Christmas, um, you know, many trips back and forth to Connecticut this year. So you know, this relationship and and her and I was always enjoyed each other tremendously. Uh, I could always make her laugh, um, and that's how our relationship existed. But it was still very selfish because I still continued to feel like, man, you know, this is good. I don't have to worry about this. And then one day you get the phone call, and your sister tells you. Your mom has Alzheimer's, and you're like, "Holy crap!" But I'm still selfish, and I say to my sisters, "You know, I'm 74. It's more like uh, dementia." I'm trying to, you know, tell myself this more than anybody. So I went down to Connecticut for a year, and I stayed and lived lived in my mother's house with her. Uh, it gave me a chance to spend some quality time with her, and then I moved back home to Maine, and. My sister called me. She says you need to come down. She says she's getting worse. And my sisters can be a little dramatic, so I go down, and that's the first time when you look in your mother's face and she doesn't recognize you. And you don't, unless that's happened to you, you have no idea what that feels like, and the impact it has on you. You have no idea when you go home. And you wake up on your birthday that that call's not coming because she can't. And that was my third reckoning of this selfishness and this inability to look beyond myself and realize what time had taken away and stolen from me, and I allowed it to. Um, very painful. So, without leaving you on this really, really drab note, I want to just share this one story with you. And if any of you are out in, in the audience who are experiencing this, or going through this, or have been through this, please listen to the lesson that I'm going to give you. My sister had lost her husband, and she had to get a new dress for the funeral. Now. My sister, this particular sister, has to have a new dress for every event. Like her daughter had her first pimple, she went out and got a dress. Okay. So here goes my sister into the dress store, and there goes my mother, and here goes me right behind her. And I look down, and Mum's got her shoes on the wrong feet, and she had her favorite moccasins on. I said, Mum, your shoes are on the wrong feet. No, they're not. Jesus Christ, what's the matter with you? I said, Mom, they are. It's okay. I said, There's a bench in the store. Sit, sit on the bench, and I'll fix them. So she sits down. I bend down, switch the shoes. Said, Okay, Mom. And she stands up, and I brush her pant legs down, get her all cleaned up, and we're moving along now again behind my sister. My mother had a beautiful, beautiful singing voice, and in the middle of the store. Out of nowhere, without warning, she sings. It had to be you. You fucked up your shoes. <laughs> and my sister is mortified. And I'm like, Cindy, you don't know any of these people in this room. She said, "You can't talk like that. You can tell her to stop." I said, "I'm not telling her to stop nothing." And she, my sister, said, "What's wrong with you?" I said, "Cindy." Remember this moment, because you're going to need it. Because soon it's going to be all we have, and that's what I want you to take with you. Thank you. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope that this has inspired in you the want and the will to come forward and share your stories. If you have interest, please contact any member of the RFA or just stop in the front office. I'm pretty sure if you say, I'm thinking Millie will sign you up immediately, okay? <laughs> so thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again. Good night, everybody.